Ben Rogers interviews Jesus. The recording took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 4th of February, 2013. Hello, Richard. Yeah, I'm Ben. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm Ben. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, uh, I just... Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. 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 Ye
I'm not Alan John Miller. I am the Messiah of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's a good question. And actually, no one's asked me that before. <laughs> um, it was about, it was close to eight years ago or nine years ago. And I was reading through the pageant messages. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're a, they're a heap of channeled material that was written over a hundred years ago. Yep via a man who wrote, he hand wrote the material and the channeling supposedly is from Jesus, right? Okay. And as as I was reading through the material, I, I was realizing that I that I knew what all the material would be. Okay. Like, and and then, I, then that sort of snowballed me down through this emotional process of coming to terms with why I knew what the material would okay. be even though I'd never read the material before. Is there a possibility, uh, can I, Richard, can we just get another angle too? So yep. just kind of direct him as well. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, uh, like is there a possibility that, um, because you're not, because you, you know, have you worked in a religious capacity before this period or was this? Uh, certainly, I was a, I had a, I was a member of the Jehovah's Witness yeah, okay, uh, okay. religion way before then, okay. another <clears throat> probably eight years earlier. Is, is there a possibility like. that because you <coughs> are knowledgeable about the Bible and that sort of thing, that maybe you read a lot into it and were like, "Hey, I know, <laughs> I know, I have the answers because I've know the source material." I guess. Um, well, no. the The memories that I have of my life isn't; they aren't in the Bible. Okay. Um, so the Bible is very different to what my memories of my life in the first century were first century. but also it's not just a memory of my life in the first century it's a memory of my life over 2000 years so i've got okay. memories uh, of my life in the first century fairly deep when i say detailed memories i can remember most events in the first century and and also most events of what happened over for 2000 years in the spirit in the spirit world as well okay. so it's sort of like with you with your life yep. the way you know that you're you is and have some kind of self cognizance is by having a heap of memories about your life. Okay. And the way I know I'm me is because I have a whole heap of memories for the last two thousand years about my life. Does that make okay. sense? Okay. So there's not a it's not a um feeling that oh all of a sudden I come to recognise that I'm Jesus and uh and somehow I believe it. It's it's all about having memories of uh, over two thousand years of life that that can bring me no other conclusion as to who I am. And in fact, right. in the end, I know who I am. So um, there's no doubt for me. Um, but very few people have ever asked me about my memories. And so okay. very few people believe who I am as a result. Does that make okay. sense? Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, mm. Also, when, you're, when you talk about having these like memories, do you have memories of people who, for example, it could be historical figures that aren't well known in a Western sense. So, yeah. for example, like uh, Confucius. You know what I mean? Like, is it, or is this? Is this like I've heard I, I, like through different channels that you have memories of meeting like Gandhi and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What about like but what about other my, people outside of? Yeah, most you know, of like, my memories are not about so-called famous people on earth. Okay. They're, they're about just people who are not even written about in history. Okay. But but who I've had personal experiences with for two thousand years. Would, would you be able to name any? Uh, certainly, like uh, for example, um, there's a lady called Rachel. There's a lady called Rachel. Um, she she was a great friend of mine and Mary's in the first century, and okay. uh, and we have a memory of you know spending time with her for two thousand years, pretty much. And um, she she was the person who basically. I helped Mary after I died and Mary was pregnant after I died and Rachel helped her go to Egypt and in fact uh, in Egypt there was a decision that was made uh, by some other people that are known in the Bible John the Apostle John is one of them mm -hmm. but um, but Rachel finished up uh, staying behind in Egypt and the Roman soldiers caught up with her and killed her and but we know her we've known her for 2,000 years but but she's not written about in the Bible at all Gotcha. Um, so there are lots and lots of people like that that we've known over 2,000 years of time that there's no knowledge of them in the Bible or anywhere else. Is there a planet. historical record of such a person called Ray? Ray? Like, have you no. been able to? Tr no, be able no, no, there wouldn't be because she's like someone who. 
No, there wouldn't be because she she was never written about in the first century, and she her her husband was written about Timothy. And okay. He's written about in the Bible, but but he, he, his wife Rachel was not written about. Okay. And so you know, there's no record of her in the Bible. There's barely a record of Mem- Mary in the Bible. There's only yeah, four yeah. times that she's actually mentioned, okay. because most mostly it was men who wrote the Bible, and so yeah, you know, they didn't well, they, write much about women. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, Richard, can we get another angle over from here? Yep. Just move across. Just try and mix it up. Sure. But um, okay. So, but also within the Bible itself, um, there is, I mean, there's a lot of conflicting sort of historical, you know, when it was written and that sort of thing. Totally. By by different authors, I think. Totally. I think it was it Luke. Uh, uh, hang on. Matthew, Mark, Luke, yeah, John. Ma- Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But mm-hmm. like they they kind of said at different time periods, this all happened, and a lot of it is very blurry historical line it's very contradictory yeah and, and the there was is, uh, is is that how do you no, i mean there's a lot of hysterical uh, historical evidence suggests that maybe jesus didn't even exist how, <laughs> how do you well I, well i know i existed but other people have to decide whether i did or not i suppose but yeah i know how long i've existed and i know when i you know shortly after i was born when i started to have okay. some kind of mental cognizance of who i was in the first century from then on I've remembered who I am but um, so in terms of what I say to people who don't believe that Jesus existed well my feelings are they need to come to some conclusion about that themselves I I don't really want to manipulate their conclusions Mm -hmm. and I know I existed I don't really feel like I need to say anything more than that Um, yeah but would it not help your case if there was this sort of oh this like if there was a historical record, like we look at other um, historical figures that we say, oh, they existed because we can see their tomb, we can see their, mm. we can see that. But like it, in your case, when if you Massive. make a claim or something like that, mm-hmm. obviously there's a lot of people who are like, but hang on, did this guy even exist in a way? Like, <laughs> it, 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 yeah. you know, because like we we look at the record and we try to match. That's how history yeah. works. Well, let, let's firstly state that the Bible record of myself is uh, contradictory. And the reason why it's contradictory was it was written by different people and embellished later on. Yes. And a lot of what the Bible says happened didn't happen, and a lot of what the Bible says didn't happen did happen. And there are whole gaps in my life yep. in the Bible as well. So the Bible is not a very accurate record of what happened in my life for a start. Secondly, there is only a one other recording that I know of about that referred to me in any way uh, from historically, and that was the records of Josephus. Mm. Um, but he only briefly rec- uh, mentioned myself, um, and and also there is a suspicion by some scholars that that was added at some later time in history as well. So the reality is, I don't feel history, the way it's written, helps anybody, because most of what's written in history is an embellishment on the part of the person who wrote it. It's like it's a story given by the person who's writing it, mm. which is often a great manipulation of what actually happened. But, but a lot of history too is the use of primary sources, whether they be, uh, you know, statues, that sort of thing. True, where there's some cooperative Yeah, yeah, evidence, we, can, yeah. we can say that's, you know, Alexander the Great sword, something like that. Yeah. We, we, there's that sort of thing, but the, because the Bible's based on accounts and not always... Not always uh, accurate accounts. Not always, yeah, and that sort of thing, mm. that this may lead to a lot of questions about, you know, the existence. Yeah, and I'm perfectly happy to answer the questions. Um, it's it, like to me, it doesn't really matter what's been written about me. What matters is what is the truth, and and I and it's not even what is the truth about me that worries me very much at mm. all. And um, what what I feel is more concerning is what is the truth about the universe and other things. Okay. But a lot of people focus on because I'm saying I'm Jesus. A lot of people then focus all of their effort and trying to find out about me rather than like have a good listen to what I'm talking about and ask themselves whether it makes any sense or not. Okay. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. So I feel in time um, that pretty much everything, that's, everything that can be asked will be asked and also in time everything that uh, you know, can be presented will be presented and then people can be left up to their own mind and opinion about what they want to choose to believe. And I don't need them to believe me. Um, I, I'm just passionate about sharing okay. things with other people, and yeah. and that's what I do. Okay, next question. Yeah. Maybe Richard, maybe try a different over this way. Thanks, man. Okay, uh, you've said that you will be able to perform miracles when you become with, one with God. Mm-hmm. Now, 
What does that look like? Um, well, I didn't actually say I'd be able to perform miracles when I become at one with God. I said God would be able to perform miracles through me when I become at okay. one with God. Okay. So, you know, clarify, to, sorry. if we can yeah. clarify that. And the reality is that God can perform miracles through any person who becomes at one with God. It's not specifically Jesus. It's it's any person who desires to become at one with God through go through the process that God has designed to do that. We can become at one with God. And once they're at one with God, God can exercise his thoughts, feelings, and other, and other, and particularly his love through mm. the person in terms of accomplishing things. And that can occur for any person who becomes at one with God, not, not specifically for myself. Yeah, okay. So uh, what it looks like is that uh, a lot of natural events, what, uh, what people would call natural events, like, uh, for example, a lot of people are not aware that sickness is the result of different held on to emotions within the body of the individual that cause certain problems in certain places. And a lot of people are also not aware that uh, spirits or people who have died in the past are attached to them through some kind of experience emotionally. Um, that can often cause a degradation of that particular part of the body. And this is where, why a lot of people get illnesses that we feel are critical, like cancers and stuff like that. And the reality is all of those can be healed quite easily once a person understands what's going on. So when you're at one with God, you understand what's going on. And so it's relatively easy to heal those particular things that, that doctors and others feel are quite difficult to heal at different times. Okay. Well, going on that point, would you suggest that people don't seek medical attention, seeing as if being one with God is so essential to curing ailments or getting rid of... Because, like, we have a lot of evidence to prove that bacteria is the reason that we get the flu and that sort of thing. Are, yeah, you, but are it, you saying that it's just, like, when someone gets the cold, it's a spirit or it's a... No, I'm saying there's an emotion within the individual that causes them to be susceptible to a virus that would not normally they would not normally be acceptable because right in your body right at the moment there are literally thousands of different types of organisms that could kill you yes but they don't and and you, we've got to ask the question well why don't they kill us under normal circumstances and then what causes them to be triggered into killing us at some abnormal circumstance well they can just as easily kill us there's there's every like you know, internal bleeding you know there's a lot of you know sort mm -hmm. of you know, when people have internal injuries, the acid, stomach acids burn inside and that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're very capable of destroying us. It's just thousands of years of evolution, I would argue, that is the reason why we have the body that we have, the physical form that we have, and it's yeah, not and perfect, I, but it's... And but I would in, argue that we have a soul attached to our bodies, yeah. and then we have two bodies, a spiritual one and a physical one. Yeah. But, but if we understand that the soul's emotional condition, its belief systems and everything dictate what happens to the bodies, then we'd have a better understanding of disease. And I'm not suggesting that a person doesn't go to a doctor. Yeah. What I'm suggesting is that that all people on the planet need to understand this physiology of, of disease. We need to understand how disease actually happens and how it is generated. And once we understand that, we can cure it. Okay. At the moment, we're not very good at curing a lot of things because we don't fully understand how it's actually happening. We treat the physical body as a sort of like a, a separate entity, if you like, without understanding that there are other factors determining what happens to that physical body uh, that determine how the physical re body responds under certain circumstances. And that's why we can go for many months or years even without getting a cold or without getting the flu or without having some kind of disease. And then all of a sudden we get some kind of disease because there's some kind of emotional trigger that triggers these particular things. And for every disease, there is a specific trigger. And if we understood all of that more, then we'd probably be able to cure. So, do you get yeah. sick? Well, that's because if your because of your faith and the, the devotion that you have, do you get sick? Well, I haven't been sick now for close to eight years, but uh, um, but I used to get sick before then. Okay. I, I used to get sick every month actually before then, mm. pretty much. But I haven't been sick now for around around about eight years or so. Um, I get. Uh, I, some influences that happen upon me that make me feel off, you know, like not not uh, not 100% well, but but I don't get sick anymore much at all. Do you drink kale shakes or anything like that? No, <laughs> no. Do weights? Anything? No. No, I don't do any weights. I used to do weights about eight or nine years ago, but uh, and I'd probably like to get back in them if I got Fair some enough. time, but I, okay. I don't at the moment. No. Fair enough. Yeah. Also, um, okay, so you've. Um, 
How important is technology to the dispersion of your teachings? Well, in the long run, probably not very important. Um, the, in the first century, um, teaching spread word of mouth. Yeah. People, you talk to other people and so forth. And in fact, in the end, I feel that's how most of the teachings actually get spread anyway. And that's how most truths get spread around the planet. I feel advertising or marketing something is very ineffectual, really, in a lot, a lot of ways. It's, the, it's a person who goes through a personal experience and actually come to understand some things themselves, and they like what they understand, that they then share it with others, right? Okay, now, I feel technology is just a way of them sharing it with others. Okay, you know? but yeah, um, the use of, you know, the, you've got a YouTube channel, that sort of thing, yep. you're on iTunes, that sort of thing. How important is that for people who follow your teachings to get in touch with you, you know what I mean? Because like, I see that yeah. there's like four people here, yep. and that sort of thing. But yeah, there's no, probably more than that who've you know, heard about you, listened to you, yeah, um, yeah. Like, I think in the end, I'm happy to share the truth using any medium possible. Um, so, if technology is available to me, I'll definitely use technology. However, um, I don't feel that the truth would actually spread very well unless I make personal changes, and the people who listen to the truths also make personal changes. It's a bit like. You can either be a living example of what it, what you're teaching yourself, or you can be a person who teaches a whole heap of things, but but is a bit of a hypocrite and doesn't and isn't a living example. Now, mm. if you're not a living example of what you teach, then then in the end, it doesn't matter how much exposure you have, nobody's going to in the end believe what you say. Yeah, but so, feasibly, so. you could follow your teachings and not actually have to live here. In oh, a way, like totally, you know, yeah. I mean? like you, yeah. do you know how many people like listen to like? podcast, uh, Not YouTube really. sort of um, thing? I know we've given away probably a couple of hundred thousand videos and and there's about nine or oh, 850 or so subscribers at the moment okay. on YouTube, so it's not that many. Okay. Um, but, but we don't keep track of any of those things either because we're not really, we're not focused on that either. We're, we're focused, myself and Mary are focused on practicing the truth ourselves and then sharing it with others who want to hear it, basically. That's all we do. Mm. We're not really that focused on trying to convert anybody or make anybody believe what we're talking about. We don't want to have people living with us. Or, and, and, you know, we like to live quietly, uh, as you can see. Yeah. Um, but doesn't technology allow you to disperse your views and put them sure out there, does, yeah. but, like, it's still not... Technology yeah, is just, great. You could, like you know, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's... it's would you say it's a, 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 an effective tool for you to use, or would you...? I don't know if it's that effective. I find that a lot of people listen to the YouTube presentations, for example, and, um, and then what happens is they think they understand what I'm talking about, but often when they get to a face-to-face -face interaction with me, and we have a discussion, then they realise how little they understood about what I was actually saying on the YouTube. So, so I think sometimes... Um, there needs to be more than just listening. You need to you need to be able to not only listen but also be self-reflective. And and a lot of people on the planet are not very self-reflective at this point in time. So they listen, and they might be fascinated about what they hear. But but to truly change, you've got to be self-reflective. And that quality um, is something that each person needs to develop in themselves. I feel like that's something that's independent of technology or anything else. It's a personal quality or attitude that needs to be developed, you know? Yeah. So I feel if people develop a personal quality or attitude like that, yeah. then certainly technology can be effective, but it's not it's not the end tool. It's a it's a means by which you can share information. And that's how I see it. And that's why we share information using any means that we have available to us. It's also a great way of having a fair degree of privacy while at the same time of sharing things to, with others, you know, like so instead of having to travel all over the world, which is quite hard and, and costs a lot of money, we can share all over the world without having to necessarily travel mm. to those particular locations. So okay. that's great. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of your teachings deal with the subject of love. Yep. Yeah, and, um, and, you know, love for God, you know, love for other people, that yep. sort of thing. Now, in the lives of many, you know, they, they don't have that. You know what I mean? They don't have... Well, they might be in relationships, but... 
Yeah. It, we we all we all have discontent in our lives, whether that be our relationship with our job, relationship with family, friends, that sort of thing. Yeah. By, Bad things that happen and good things that happen, like a mixture of things. The, yeah, yeah. Well, not every day is great for a lot of people, whether sure. they be, whether they be in you know whatever relationships or jobs or whatever. I agree. But by by appealing to that sense of discontent by saying you know you don't love yourself, that sort of thing, and people start to question. You know, this sort of sort of question the life and the life they're living. Yeah. Can that be destructive in the sense that you're you're getting people to look at, you know, the lack of love, and then they step away from people who actually care a great deal about them, but it just doesn't appear to be. Um, well, there's a lot of questions in your question, yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah, if yeah, we can no, answer a few of them separately. Um, firstly. Um, I believe quite strongly that if a person is ha has a lack of contentment in their personal life, that there's always usually good reasons. There's usually reasons for their discontent. And my suggestion to people is to look at the reasons for their discontent and change something. Because if you keep doing things exactly the same way for the rest of your life, you're going to end up with exactly the same discontents probably for the rest of your life. And the question I feel most people, including myself, need to ask is do I wish to be the same person as I am now in 50 years time and okay. my answer to that question is no I, I do not want to be the same person yeah. that I am now in 50 years time and I would suggest to anybody who um, who really desires a happy life that they wouldn't want to be either okay. somebody who does that oh, yeah, I was just going to say I'm answer the rest of the questions oh, okay, go, go, go. Take <laughs> it's up time, to you then like no, keep, you're driving keep, the keep interview going. No, keep going you, 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 <laughs> um, I was just the question of um, you know by appealing to that sense of discontent because like you, you know even it, some people like say you're a father yeah can I uh, address the appealing to okay. it um, I feel it's very important to appeal to that level of discontent because that level of discontent is a measure of what's going wrong in a person's life and I believe quite strongly that it's possible to have a completely happy life all the time um, okay so that's my personal belief now I know a lot of people on earth have sort of given up that belief you know a lot of people sort of feel that's not possible. They feel that it's impossible to have, um, do you want to? Did you? Start? You're right. You're right. Yeah, it quote unquote crap itself. So uh, Ben, oh. you need another cartridge or what do you want to do? It's on the ground. Oh, what, what did you, yeah, just what happened? <laughs> Richard. What? It overheated and we have no more memory on the stick itself. So okay, well, we can give you a recording the of that's these. All, we can give you the roll. Okay, yeah. if, that, if that works. Yeah, yeah. I just, I got It'll two just more take questions and then we're gone. A week or so. Yeah, to, it went, it went off about 30 so. uh, seconds ago. So you got this line here. Did, did it, okay, did it? It came with a little white flash and then at one point there was no record symbol that was on the screen itself. Okay, mm. thanks Richard. Mm. Um, okay. But we can send you a uh, Just You're going to put this on YouTube anyway, aren't you? Yeah, we do, but um, what we can do, if you want to have the raw footage, we can actually give you a copy of the raw footage if you want it on a disc. Um, no, Is just put it on YouTube it? and I'll take it off YouTube and sort it out, it's all good. No worries. Um, okay, but, okay, but by appealing to that sense of discontent, people, people like, for example, if you're a father, you have to get up and provide. And that's just, that's, you've got I to get up. I don't agree with that. You don't agree that no. you should... Not a few. I, I feel you see a lot of people in their day-to-day -day life feel they have to do a lot of things. Yeah. And, and the reality is we're afraid and that's why we do a lot of the things we do. Okay. So for example, a father who gets up and feels he has to provide is not in that moment really loving what he does. He's doing it because he, he's, it's a drudgery, you know, something he has to yeah. do. My feelings are he needs to go and find something he loves and then he won't feel like it's a drudgery and he won't feel like he has to get up every morning to provide. He'll feel like he wants to get up every morning and go and do what he loves. It's a bit like you with your, uh, your own uh, stuff that you're looking forward to doing in your future. If you choose a job that, that you're not passionate about, then it's mm. highly unlikely you're really going to love it and you're probably just going to drudge your way through the job completely. And to me, that's a very pointless thing to do. There are many jobs, if you like, on the planet that a person can love. In fact, I've, I've experienced many jobs right from cleaning right the way through, and I loved every one of them. So I feel there's like a lot of jobs that a person can have um, and really enjoy it. And, and that drives them to get up and, you know, to, to enjoy yeah, okay. to drive them. So I feel that's a, that's it's a, all about passion. That's a message a lot of people can agree with, the idea of you should find a job that, you love. that you love. But for some people, yeah. for some people, for whatever reason, they don't have that. Whether it's whether it's relationships with friends, jobs, that and sort of so thing. And so what I say to them but is... But when, when you say, I'm Jesus, 
I think you should do what you love, and that can lead to destructive outcomes. Even though for the individual, that might you know yeah, it might I, be I a liberating feeling. I feel that can't lead to destruct to destructive outcomes. But say, but say, just a hypothetical situation mm -hmm. where someone says, "Oh, I listens to you." Mm -hmm. Say, oh, I, you know, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus, and then they're like, they look, they hear what you say, and then what happens is they go and they say, well, I don't love my job. I don't love my life. My family can be a bit of a tire sometimes, and they go and leave. Do you understand how that could be a really negative situation for the people he yeah, leaves if behind? They, if they love their family, they wouldn't do that for a start. So if they truly love their family, they would try to work through any issues with their family that cause any of their any of their unhappiness. Okay. And so the first thing I would recommend to them is not to just leave a, what they feel is an unhappy situation, but rather if they followed my teachings, they would actually work through why they find their particular situation unhappy. So, okay. so for example, if, if they find their situation unhappy because they're having an argument with their wife every day about sex, then my suggestion is both the husband and wife need to sit down and work out the issues about sex that they have. If they find that they're unhappy because of any reason with the children, looking after the children, then they need to sit down as a family and determine why they're unhappy. Right. That's what would be my suggestion. I mm. feel, though, that the unhappiness is a measure of something that needs to change. And my suggestion to people is to feel when they're unhappy and then work their way through okay. what, what's the cause of that unhappiness. Right. Not just have a blanket, oh, leave this situation because that doesn't address the actual cause of the unhappiness okay. in most cases. And also, um, if you're Jesus, why are you here, not the Middle East? <laughs> well, there's a lot of reasons why I'm here and not in the Middle East, but um, there's physical reasons, emotional ones, and teaching-based ones. Um, but when, when, if, if you are, you know, the guy from the first century, wouldn't you want to be, go back to where, you know, Bethlehem, that sort of thing? Why when, then? Well, because that's... The origin story but That's... can you see how basic you're seeing me as an individual like um, yeah, you're, you're sort of seeing me as a person who has some kind of um, nostalgia for the past Oh no, well, it's just that, that's where your message, that will, if, if, I mean, if you're interested in spreading these ideals, surely that's the best place to go, Definitely where you'd get not. the most receptive. Definitely not. I would get the least reception there. You think? Definitely, yeah. Even though, even though that's where you hailed from, that's the yeah. sort of birthplace of Christianity? Well, you think of what happened in the first century, I got very little reception there. And a lot of people were waiting for you to come back too. That's... Yeah, but they were waiting for me 2,000 years ago to come back and they rejected the fact that right. I came back then. So. So the reality is that I don't see the Middle East as a place that at the moment is very open to receiving truth, but, but in the future it may be, and so I'm happy to share it with them when they want to. What I feel drawn towards is going to places that, are, that have the most desire to understand the truth. And, and I feel that that's one of the reasons why I'm here, but it's also one of the reasons why we go to different places around the world, because there's a strong desire in different places to, to listen to the truth and so I share it in those places and I don't feel the Middle East is one of those places and I don't have any feelings of nostalgia about my past life in the first century you remember I've had 2,000 years of life and for 1950 or so of those years I spent them in, in a completely different location in, in another dimension not, not here on the earth so, mm. so if any place, if, if I'm attached to any place it's more that place than any place here on earth. Okay, if God uses his pow like powers to work through you, Jesus Christ, to perform miracles. No, remember I said God can use his powers to work through anyone okay. who's at one with God. Yeah, but uh, Jesus being the most notable example, perhaps. Well, uh, you know, historically on the earth I've been the most notable example, but in the spirit world there are millions of people who okay. work through the same, have the same kind of experience. So, like I don't, again, Everyone on earth sort of views it one way because that's their perception and that's where they're coming from. And I understand all of that, but the reality is my personal experience demonstrates that there are literally millions and millions of people who have been at one with God and who are currently at one with God in the spirit world in these other dimensions. And they constantly can do the same things um, that I can do, so, um, or that I could do in the first century. So, so to me, it's nothing unique. It's, mm. And it's not a unique thing for one person. Does that make sense? The only, the only difference between me and anyone else is I was the first person to ever become at one with God in the first century. That's the only difference. There's no other difference between me and you. Okay. It's like, uh, how, well, how are you different to the Wright brothers? 
Well, you weren't the first person who invented flight in the Yeah, but Dutch, I just you know? didn't possess the same faculties that they did to, in order to... And you weren't us. present in history at the same time they were and yeah, so forth. Okay. So who knows what might you might do in the future that nobody okay. else has done. <laughs> okay, but, um, you know, being the guy who, you know, knows most notably Jesus' work through to perform miracles... You mean miracles. God has worked through? God has yeah. worked through. Sorry, yeah. my, my yeah. bad. Um, being the guy who has, you know, been most worked through... What kind of God wouldn't still allow people to perform miracles and act in such a way? God does. You, you believe that? Yeah, de definitely. Um, God is constantly working through all of humanity, not through, through one individual. This is one of the biggest problems with the Christian belief, is that it, it, it believes that God worked through Jesus and then Jesus worked with everyone mm. else. In other words, it believes that Jesus was a mediator between God and man. That's not the case at all. God has uh, the ability to have a direct connection with all of his children and as a result of that has the ability to work through every single one of them individually. But it depends upon them as to how much they allow that connection. And that's what I'm But if he teaching. is God, surely he can just work through people. He doesn't force himself to work through people. He, he has to allow, because he's given them the gift of free will, he, he, he needs to wait for them to have a desire for that to occur. Yeah. And and most people don't have a desire for lots of reasons. One yes. of them is that they don't believe in God, or mm. another one is that they don't believe that God can work through them, or they have feelings of unworthiness that they might feel. And there's literally thousands of reasons why a person may not wish to connect to God in this way. But what I'm saying is that everyone has the ability to. It's just, and God's waiting for them to exercise mm. that ability, but God is not going to force that upon them. God's okay. not going to force them into doing something they don't want to uh, do. Last question. Um, with um, with your belief and that sort of thing, why not join the Catholic Church? Why not join the Anglican Church? Why not join any other sort of Christian denomination? Well, there's the presumption, just because I'm saying I'm Jesus, that I believe the same things as these churches. Okay. And that's not the case at all. Um, I believe things completely like most of these churches believe the Bible is God's word. I do not believe the Bible is God's word. I've had personal experience with for 2,000 years of watching the Bible develop, and I know that it's not an accurate uh, reflection of what happened in my life in the, in the first century, and nor is it an accurate reflection of history either. Um, so I can't say the Bible is God's word, and I can't also accept many of the beliefs that these religions mm -hmm. have. For example, many of the religions believe that that Jesus is God, and I definitely know I'm not God. I know I'm a completely different entity to God. God is my Father or my Creator, just like God is your Father or Creator, and I, like I'm no different to any other person. So there's this desire that religion has to sort of elevate me above others, and and I can't agree with that. So there's there's and there's literally hundreds of things I can't agree with in terms of what they believe is truth compared to what I know to be true. So so I can't engage um, inside of a religious faith all I can do is share what I know to be the truth with others and whether and then and present logical argument to them about that particular truth and and then leave them have to have their own decision-making process about what they wish to accept that's really all I want to do I also don't want to start another religion because there's already too many religions on the planet. I think there's over 33,000 Christian denominations. You wouldn't call planet. divine truth a religion? No, not at all. No, it's, it's a sharing of a group of teachings and we, there's no religious faith, there's no practices, there's no weekends, weekend you know, uh, church uh, going activity and as the guys who are associated with me know and all I do is present information to people, that's all I do. So, so there's no religion um, and there's no organised activities um, aside from we, us organising something to do an event you know, of some kind, for example, a seminar to share some information. So, so in reality, all I am is basically like a person who shares any other kind of information and travels around doing that. And what people take from that is completely up to them, really. Like, that's how I see it, and whether they practice it is also completely up to them. How much of it they practice is also completely up to them, if they practice anything at all. There's many people I've known who've come along to seminars, and I know they don't practice any of it at all, and I'm okay with that. Um, what they do with their life is up to them, and I don't have any desire to control people's lives. I just have a desire to share what I feel is truth to others, that's all. So, yeah, that's, that's the main 
sort of feeling I have. I think that's a wrap. Can I uh, give you some recommendation and feedback? Uh, oh, about my style or anything? Yeah, like yeah. That? Sure. Okay. Oh, well, it's my first time. Like, I'm just trying to work for this company who specializes in a certain style, so that's what I've got. Yeah, um, Ben, my feelings are if you're going to interview somebody, you've got to be open to hearing their answer. And I don't feel you're open to hearing the answer. You, you ask the question and you let the answer be said. Oh, well, that's, that's for the purpose of the viewer, though. That's, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I understand hey. that. But, but to be a good interviewer, in my opinion, you've actually got to hear the answer yourself because, because if you hear the answer, you can roll off the answer. Whereas if you if you just um, if you just ask a question and then let the viewer have the answer without you actually hearing the answer, then it's not a conversation. Anymore. What do you mean by me hearing the answer? Well, um, most of the answers I gave you today, you didn't actually hear. Personally, uh, what do you mean by hear? In a way, like you absorb or like yeah, in you a didn't way. listen to. Yeah, it's because I have to interview. That's that's the thing. I ask yeah, questions, I, ask questions, I ask questions. I understand that. And then that. you give the answer, then you give the answer. And I'm just you giving you some feedback. Right. I don't agree with that. I, I feel that that method of interviewing is a is a method that alienates your listeners. Okay. And it also alienates the person that you're interviewing. Okay. Because that they, they have well, a... You understand, like, I don't know divine truth as well as you know that's divine okay. truth. So that's, that's why it's... No, it maybe this sort of, I'm not absorbing it all because it is... No, no, I don't feel you have to absorb it in terms of believing it. Or if you absorb... What I mean by absorbing the answer is it's sort of like a conversation. Do you, mm. do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, for example, if I ask you, where do you live, Ben? And then I'm not listening to you. I'm over here, and you're telling me. I've been staring at you the whole time. I, I... No, no, no. But if you just feel it emotionally, if I can, if I just detune from what you're saying in terms of where you live. So I know you live at Saint Lucia, right? Yeah. Um, in Brizzy, and uh, and it gets busy during the because I yeah. listen to all of what you said. I don't have to believe everything you say. All I need to do is listen. And um, what I'm saying is. Most of my answers I gave to you today, you wouldn't be able to even say, like I just said about St. Lucia, yeah. what I actually said without yeah. going back to the video. Well, you got to understand there's a difference between learning facts about a place and then just what is a, a, set, uh, a set of beliefs, you know what I mean? That, that's I don't a agree. Lot. Okay. I Fair don't on. agree. I feel if you're completely in a, engaged in a conversation with a mm. person, you're actually listening to them, that mm. you're, you're actually hearing what they've got to say. And, and to be honest with you, it's it's a bit, it'd be very difficult biting up another interview with you because I know that you didn't hear what I've already said. That's okay. And um, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, okay. And and my feelings are if you could hear what and I feel pretty much anyone you interview is going to feel that way. Okay. And all I'm doing is giving. I think you maybe just because of the subject matter involved, there might be a, a maybe, so, a, sort maybe. of like I'm I'm trying to answer questions, uh, ask you questions as well as absorb what you're saying. There's a lot of. I understand. Sort of, yeah. I understand. I understand. So like I've done this many hundreds of times, cool. as you can imagine. Right. And what I what I feel too is that. Um, can I just ask you a few questions? Um, well, I prefer if you weren't filming it, actually, to be honest. But well, but yeah. See now, now I, I, I I didn't. I came here to ask you questions. Yeah, but now we're in an unethical interaction, you and I. Is it time for us to leave? Do you believe? Well, you, yes. You're in an un unethical interaction because what you've done, what you've done. Is you're asking me questions that you're willing to put on YouTube, but now when I want to ask you questions, you're now not willing to do it, and that's unethical. Well, I don't see what the purpose is of interviewing you. In, well, in a sense, it's a public good of well, interviewing Well, it's not you. about public good. It's about, it's about me... Well, though, we can to, have a private conversation. It's about me wanting to know you. But you're a public figure in a lot of respects. It's quite I, sure it's, you're I don't agree. Sure it's in, um, engage, talk, muse, and actually let one follow for another... There's no real to actually have anything that's purely endemic. Purely engaged, talk, and that's what you have to do. So, like see, I, no see I feel I'd like to know you guys. Oh. And, and the audience would also like to know you guys. Oh, I don't agree that the audience has any... Like, to me, that's the purpose of a journalist, is to just go in there, talk... And this is where I have to disagree with all okay. the journalists. Well, I mean, that's, well, <laughs> I've that's, had that said to me hundreds know, of times. I know, I know, I know. And, but, like, that's, that's, and that's I can't the profession. Agree with that. that's, see, I don't agree is, with that. We're not meant to know each other as friends. Exactly. That's because that's because no one. It's there's a sense of you know I won't report objectively if that's the case. Yes, but I see. I feel that you can be objective, even if. But everybody has their own sense of objectivity. I, I agree with that. But I feel what what's happening here is the media industry is trying to present a facade, and while you're trying to present present a facade, particularly of yourselves, then it's going to be very very difficult for for any audience to engage with you. 
like if you look at the media reporters who are the most popular, they are generally the ones who are the most engaged. So they're almost the opposite. They are the, are the opposite as what the, the general journalistic uh, viewpoint is, and yet they are the ones who generally receive the most work and also receive the most listening by an audience. And I feel, I feel this is a, the unethical nature of of the of the journalist industry is that you're expecting people to expose themselves to you but while at the same time being un completely unwilling to expose oh, well, yourself. But, that, but that's the thing, because the journalist isn't meant to be a celebrity, in a way. It's just meant to, you're meant to, I yeah, in, in that sense that... In Most the, journalists are celebrities. Oh, not really. No, <laughs> I don't think, I, I wouldn't say so. I would say that their more job is to just be a sort of, you know, ask questions. That's their job. They're not, they're not like, whenever I see a journalist on television who's being interviewed about their opinion on something, I feel like, I kind of feel like as if they're not they're doing a disservice in a way because like then I go look at their reports next and I go well are you bringing this to the table so that's why I, I don't yeah I don't agree what I'm okay. saying is I don't agree with that method because it, it alienates not only the person you're interviewing but it also alienates your viewers from you and and you think that that's good I understand that you think mm. that's good but I, I can't see how it is good. well I mean uh, I could give you a good example if you like sure. um, the, you know Frost Nixon there was a clear example of, you know, when Nick Richard Nixon was sat down with David Frost mm -hmm. after the uh, Pentagon tapes, mm -hmm. uh, no, the um, Watergate tapes, Watergate, yep. and they um, and they hashed it out, and basically there was no, you know, he was asking questions of someone, and mm -hmm. there was no, and it was a great interview, it's probably one of the most historic interviews, and there were, he followed that style of just talking to him and asking the question. Yeah, but again, I feel quite strongly that you would get more information out of a person by having a more open well, that's why, that's why me and Richard both came here, with the sense of just being civil and that sort of thing and sitting down and talking. I don't think we'll ever be um, enough for you. I, I, I get the sense... It's not about uh, it's not about enough for me. Yeah. It's not about that. I'm just giving you some feedback that okay. you obviously you're resistive to receiving. No, no, oh, I, I'm a, like... To my, to, to my, whatever, I am at the start of this process. So I might, you might talk to me in 20 years' time and I'll be a different person. And Carbon you, as an element has developed in over a period of a couple of uh, thousands of years. The pressure acts upon it and then it forces it done. So it demonstrates it's a carbon. It's a very intelligent guy. Yeah. Well, yeah, and what I'm suggesting is that it doesn't have to be like that. What I'm okay. suggesting is that if you listen to some feedback from a person who's been interviewed many, very many times, you may finish up with having. A far yeah. Okay, but, but I, I, would say, I would I would say that there's some people who interview you, and then they might go interview someone else, and they're the same, essentially the same interview. It's just the this is the way you're different from. Okay, say someone comes to you, they're a journalist, and they talk to you, and they go to, they talk to John Travolta. They go talk to John Travolta. There's going to be a different interview. Why? Why? Because they're di you're different people. Yeah, but if you interact... But they're going to be the same journalist, in a way. If, if you interact personally with the individual, it's always going to be engaging. Okay. That's my opinion. Do what do you... What do you, you have nice hair. What, what do you... Is, is that... Like, no, no, no. What, what are you all. trying to mean? Like, I'm trying to... I know you, know you don't understand what I'm saying to you, and that's fine. But that's clearly because you know it better than no, anyone. Like. No, I'm just saying to you that, that if you allowed your personality to come out on camera, rather than just having a very rigid... You know, feel on camera, yeah. and you just allowed yourself to be yourself and share a bit about yourself. Your audience will connect with you far better, and will also connect with where you're coming from far more. They'll feel more engaged, and the person you're interviewing, you'll probably get more information out of okay. than if you use your current style. And I know, I, I, I honestly like we had no intention of coming here and shouting at you if that's what you were thinking. Like no, we, we were just we were just going to be civil and we were just going to ask curious questions that we thought. Yeah. People and would I, be interested because that's you got to face it. There's people who you know you know what you believe better than people who just come here and interview. I agree. Exactly. Yeah. So we're coming here and we're just trying to figure out, get some answers, that sort of thing. So, but it, you're not it, really but it can, to get but it can kind of. Yeah, I think people, I think you gave a lot of explanations. So that's yeah. That's but you're an not answer. trying to get answers for yourself. You're trying to get answers for an audience. Is is that? Is that wrong? Well, I feel if you were engaged and you try to get answers for yourself, then the audience would automatically be more engaged as well. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand your point. I understand your point. And, and, you know, I understand where you're coming from because you've come from this, you know, the, the general interview style that you've been taught and so forth, and I get all that. I haven't that. been taught anything. I, I well, see, it's so something that you 
want to engage, obviously, and and I'm just giving you a little feedback about it. That's all, um, and and you don't have to take it. Like I'm perfectly yeah. happy yeah. with you not taking it. I'm just giving you some feedback about it. But also, I'm wanting to address with you the unethical behaviour, which is expecting people to expose their life when you're not willing to expose yours. Well, you, I don't see why that's an issue because I'm asking you questions. Well, like when it, well when you don't see you know Daniel Craig asking an interviewer questions. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? That's the thing. It's an interview. Well, I ask you. Yeah, questions. I know what is normally done, but what I'm telling you is it's yeah, Have you thought of going into journalism yourself? As no. A, but if I did, I'd be doing it completely different. Okay. Well, if I did, what I would do is I would, if I expected you to bear your soul, yeah. I would be willing to bear my own. Okay. That's, well, that's ethics. Okay. If you feel that, I, I don't, see, like, I, I doubt I've ever seen an interview where, you know, one, like, one celebrity was crying and then the interview was crying because they're like, I can relate to you. There's, there's. Yeah, I don't think you know that's I mean? necessary. Like that's, I mean, you know, like I don't think that's necessary. I feel, I feel if the person who's doing the interview truly loves doing the interview, they'll just be themselves, but they'd also be willing to te tell a bit about themselves. Okay. And well, when I, I've asked you a bit about yourself, you've been unwilling to tell it. And what I'm saying to you is that's unethical. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Now, you don't have to agree with me. Okay. That's how I see it. Well, I, 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 thought I would I'd never come do to the you. same I, with you. I, I thought I'd come to you with questions that perhaps you, on a deeper level that you haven't been asked before. Stuff like people will go to you and they were like, why aren't you performing miracles? I'm more interested in why you believe God's not working through you to perform miracles. Yeah. If you are Jesus. Yeah. That's, that's, that's why I asked you. And that's why yep. I didn't just say, why you wear glasses? That sort of thing. Yep. I don't, I'm not interested in that level. I'd rather go a bit deeper and find out yeah, what's no, going I, on. I'm perfectly happy with all that. What I'm suggesting to you is that if you want me to give you information about myself, then it would be unethical of you to not share information about yourself. That's what I'm suggesting. I, I, I don't I don't think that's the style of an interview. I don't think that's the purpose. I know it's not the style of Maybe in a twenty years time when you know more about me, that'd be a different conversation. You'd know who I am. When someone when someone from sixty minutes comes to you, you know hey, yeah, that's, then you're that's not a... getting my point, but that's fine. Yeah, okay. too, you know, like like when you expect somebody else to do what you're not willing to do yourself that's a lack of ethics that's what i'm saying okay and this is where i see a lack of ethics in journalism is because if the journalists often expect other people to do things that they themselves will not do that's and also like I, I honestly people are more interested in what you have to say than what i mean i have to say i that's, don't agree with that look i i don't agree with that you compared to me right now like there's a situation where i'm just trying to be a journalist and you're in a position. Uh, yeah, no, I don't agree with that. Okay. If, you, if you saw how many comments we get about the journalist who's asked the questions rather than anything I've said in answer, you'd be surprised that most people are interested in the personality and the individual of the person who, who are engaged together. That's what I find. Okay. Um, and that's the kind of people generally who listen to the YouTube channel that we've oh, okay. got. Um, they are very interested in where you're coming from. They're very interested in why you come with that group of questions. What's the underlying motivation for those particular questions, for example? They're very interested in those things. So, yeah, I, I feel this is where I feel the general journalistic arguments don't really hold much logical water, as far as I'm concerned, with regard to why journalists generally don't allow a more fluid uh, process to occur. That's okay. my per personal okay, opinion. Fair enough. Mm. Okay. But um, you can take that or leave yeah. that. It's up to you. you know? I'm, I'm perfectly happy either way. The I just feel that um, for your own sake of your own career, if you allow, just even consider allowing more of your own personality coming out, um, I think you'll have a better career. Oh, I thought I thought I did that uh, in a way by by saying kale. <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to joke with you just to sort of get you to talk for more a bit, but I, I don't feel that people, you know, I can add personality to report if you want, but no, yeah. look, if that's what you really want, Mr. No, Miller, see, it's not about I can... what I want. It's about, it's about you just being you. Yeah, I'm quite comfortable with who I am, so that's, yeah. there we go. Yeah, we and, I, and I don't see that. Because okay. you're, because you're, when I ask you a personal question about you, you instantly do not want to answer it. Well, that's because I came to interview you. I didn't came to here to be interviewed. And and according to the participant form that you signed, you did. No, I didn't. 
Yeah, you did, because it talks about ethical behaviour. In the well, but, you, but that's your interpretation of ethics, so... No, it's not my interpretation of ethics. No, ethics is very it, interpretable, I, my friend. If you go and study ethics, you'll find <laughs> look, that it's exact. It's look, what everybody thinks. Me and Richard are going to head off. Yep. We want to thank you for your time. I, I will take on board your advice about journalism. You don't have to. I don't just, have to, but I, I will listen to it. I heard yeah. it. Thank you. No I worries. just want to appreciate it. No worries, appreciate man. It. So, thank you very much. I think right. that it's best to actually argue a freedom of dialogue and maybe one, one way we can actually accept some substance of one of all human beings. Can you say that again for me slower? <laughs> I said that ultimately what you're proposing after that 10 minutes or diatribe was a freedom of dialogue. And a freedom of dialogue actually comes from that interaction with other human beings. And once we actually can approach that, you know, get the, uh, this crazy life, right, we call hell, or life. Yeah, no, I agree with you <laughs> totally. I feel, I feel what you said is really important. Like. If we have a free interaction, without any sort of, um, without any concern about who's listening or what they're listening to or what they might think about it, then you'll get the best possible result every single time. I feel, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, same goes. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. See you later, guys. <laughs> More words of Stubbs Adams. So this is Lena, by the way. Hi. 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 See you later then. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye guys. Yeah. Hey. You wanna get some peanuts in King of Fire? <laughs> <laughs>